Hi, today we'll cover 25 games that defined 1992. So, here we go. Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis is what fourth movie in the indie series should have been, but instead we've got Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal School, which was a bit of a letdown. There's a new one now, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, but I've not seen it yet. I have high hopes though. Anyway, Fate of Atlantis was arguably the most ambitious and biggest in scope out of all LucasArts adventure games at the time of its release. Armed with his iconic whip, unquestionable courage and his troublesome wits, Indy partners up with his old friend, a beautiful redhead Sophia Hubgood. Together, they must embark on an awesome and filled with dangers to the brim adventure, looking for the long lost continent of Atlantis. While the puzzles are quite tough in this one, demanding sharp thinking and observational skills, they are not illogical, as in many other point and click games, so you should never really be left in a situation where you're lost. Most of them are inventory based, though some may be reliant on picking the right dialogues in conversations too. A very unique at the time feature was the ability to complete the game in one of three different ways, aka paths that you get to follow. So, somewhere around the early mid game, you can choose one of the three the team path, the wits path, and the fists path. First, we'll allow Indy to take Sophia with him and she will support him all throughout the adventure. Second, adds more puzzles and always presents more complex and challenging versions of them, it's the de facto hard mode of the game. And finally, the fists path focuses on action sequences and fist fighting, which in itself is completely optional in the first two. On top of that, there are also three entirely different endings, a good one and two bad ones. So, Fate of Atlantis, unlike most adventure games of the time, offers a lot of replayability. I'm sure that you noticed me implying it as I was talking about the game, but since I've not said it out loud, let me make things clear here and now. Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis is hella fun, and that's what's most important about it here. 1992 was a big year for gaming. Many now considered classics came out and gamers had their hands full of awesome titles to complete. But among point and clickers, there were no better games than indie. Ultima Underworld The Stygian Abyss is historically the very first first-person role-playing with real full 3D environments and fluid motion. It was also first game in the genre to allow for looking up and down, swimming in bodies of water, jumping and featured non-linear gameplay. Haunted by the ghostly nightmares foretelling the great danger befalling upon Britannia, Avatar decides to travel there once more. When he arrives, however, he's unwillingly a witness of a kidnapping, a kidnapping of Baron Almerick's daughter no less. Given the unfortunate time and place he arrived in, he is nearly instantly found guilty of the crime and thrown into the Great Stygian Abyss, a vast cave system containing remnants of old utopian civilization. Given that he can either die there doing nothing or try to find the girl and clear his name, he goes for the latter. The dungeon is not only filled with monsters though and you get to meet many different NPCs with whom you can interact in other ways than combat. And since it's been mentioned already, since combat is action based, you have to hold the mouse button for basic attacks of various strength and aim those attacks at the enemies. There are a few different types of these, unique for each weapon, jabs and slashes among others. There's also magic, you know, like you'd expect from a fantasy RPG, and it's rune based. Appropriate combination of runes produces a specific magical effect. Personally, I hate rune based spell systems as I find them to be unnecessarily overcomplicated, but if you don't mind, it shouldn't be an issue. Interestingly enough, at the beginning of the game, you're asked to create your avatar, and the choice allows for picking of a class, initial skills, and gender, so for once, avatar could be a girl. Leveling up raises hit points and mana, but skills are increased by accumulation of experience points or by reciting mantras in special shrines. Ultima Underworld was a very important game in the history of RPG as it proved that they could not only be running in real time but also didn't have to rely on jerky grid based movement and could be rather immersive. Quest for Glory 3 Wages of War is a third title in the long running series of cult classic Sierra's adventure role playing games. It starts with our hero traveling with Lion Thor Paladin Rakish, Uhura, nope, not the one from Star Trek fame, and her son Simba, also not the one from Lion King, to the kingdom of Frikana a jungle and savanna country inspired by the Central African ecosystems, homeland to indigenous half-man, half-lion linotaurs. The capital city of Tarna is on the brink of war with the opposing race of leopard men. Both of the tribes have stolen relics from one another and both refuse to give it back before the other does the same first. It's a typical stalemate situation happening when sites involved in a conflict are short-sighted and simple-minded. You know, what we face in real world basically every single day, both on a macro and micro scale. Anyway, your task starts with trying to figure out a solution to end the conflict between the two races, all to focus on a much bigger problem later. 
an evil demon wizard that everyone seems to be ignoring, focusing on their petty inner fightings. Eventually you'll need to unite both races to stop the demon from releasing its wrath upon the world. Same as in most other Quest for Glory games, you get to pick your character class upon starting and it can be either fighter, mage or thief. There's a fourth hidden class of Paladin too, but it requires you to complete the previous game honorably enough for the Rakish to proclaim you one and then import that character to Wages of War. It's a very fun and niche touch by the devs, especially that all classes play in a unique way and have access to different skills. Gameplay-wise, not much has changed from the earlier titles, you still travel the land talking to dozens of interesting characters, solve puzzles, many of which are inventory-based, and take part in combat encounters. You also earn experience, level up and improve your character while playing. Fun stuff! Skills are raised after combat or repeat use and battles often happen randomly while traversing the overworld map. Wages of War is a really fun and involving experience with an interesting plot and enjoyable genre mixture that will keep you glued to the screen to its cliffhanger of an ending. I could edit this spoiler out before posting the video, but I elected not to. You know why? Because it changes nothing, the game loses none of its charm and playability and now you know that there's something that will happen at the end and will lead you to a fun next outing. King's Quest VI Air Today Gone Tomorrow is a point and click adventure game. Story wise, it's as good as expected of Sierra, not in small parts, thanks to Roberta Williams, who was responsible for the best of all their games. Prince Alexander of Daventry, madly in love with Princess Kasima, unable to hold his feelings in anymore hires a ship to search for the Green Isles, Princess's home kingdom, to find her and cringe her out of any potential future relationship with his overexcitement by proclaiming his love for her after meeting her once in a previous game. Months pass and this sea is a cruel lady, salty, cold and uninviting, but a fair one as well and eventually decides to reward our prince by getting him close to the Green Isles. As soon as the Alexander lays eyes on the kingdom, a freak storm breaks out, destroys his ship and leaves him as the only survivor. What's more, he soon learns that both King and Queen of Green Isles have passed, that the kingdom may be on the brink of a deadly war and that his beloved Princess Cassima is held captive, imprisoned by the evil royal vizier. Say what you want about Roberta, but she could craft a suspense like no other. Anyway, the most interesting thing about King's Quest VI, however, is how the game is designed. Almost half of all the puzzles are entirely optional, many of them have more than one solution and thanks to the title's fully open world design, they can be completed in any order. Even better, more or less midway through the game, you'll be able to choose to follow the longer, more puzzle-oriented or a shorter story path. The longer culminates in more satisfying game ending, but many of the parts of the ending are based on the choices taken throughout the game, so they can vary considerably with each playthrough if different riddles are solved and especially if they're completed in different ways. And shorter, well, it's simpler and shorter and a good pick if you just want to complete the story and don't get involved as much. While King's Quest VI is nowhere near being the best adventure of 1992, that still goes to indie obviously, it's definitely one of the more interestingly and unusually designed ones. Realms of Arcania Blade of Destiny is a full-fledged role-playing and I've no clue why I said it, because of course that it is. It's also a first title in Realms of Arcania trilogy, based on German pen and paper RPG system, The Dark Eye. The Orc tribes of Northland somehow manage to organize themselves under strong leadership and are not scattered random groups of mad braves anymore. What's more, they're planning a full-scale attack on human settlements. The only way of stopping their onslaught now is finding and using the mythical sword known as Grimring the Blade of Destiny, as it's the only weapon to defeat the Orcish Chief and his army of minions. The whereabouts of sword are unknown, so a party of brave adventurers is hired to find it, your party. First to locate map pieces leading to it, then the sword itself, and then eventually to use it and stop the invasion. Realms of Arcania is not just combat oriented, like many of these earlier games were, especially the dungeon crawlers, but a very deep and engaging experience, in which you have to track a lot of things directly unrelated to the plot throughout your playthrough. So, for instance, separate counters for first and hunger for all six of your adventurers. Your party can be split at any point into smaller teams and controlled separately if necessary, which may come in handy more than once while solving some of those more demanding puzzles. During traversal, Blade of Destiny holds a typical for the genre first person view and switches into top down isometric grid based tactical display for combat encounters. And these are actually really, really deep. Well, at least when compared to the industry standard at the time. And fun too. That's worth highlighting, I think, because, you know, you do want your games to be fun, right? The controls are rather clunky, that's for sure, but given the scope of the game and how much it actually does well, it's hardly a detractor from playing. If you enjoy good, big and time-consuming RPGs, with huge worlds and hundreds upon hundreds of items, you've hit the jackpot here, because Blade of Destiny is definitely a game for you.
Moonstone Hard Day's Night is a game of many genres. It's a multiplayer party real-time role-playing board game with beat-em-up combat sequences. And yes, I said board game and I'm standing by it. That's my simplified definition of it at the very least. And I know, I know, it does not sound simple at all. My love for Moonstone is not a secret to any of the long-time subscribers of this channel, I have a whole separate review covering it. Sure, it's an older, a bit rough video to watch now, but I do talk about Moonstone in more detail there. And even though it covers the Amiga version, other than not sounding as good, PC Sport is virtually identical. Anyway, while theoretically you can play Moonstone alone, it is a game designed to be enjoyed with others, preferably by four players all at once. The goal of it is simple. Something's happening in the lands and it's nothing good. Quite the contrary, the evil is approaching and the only way to stop it is by using a titular Moonstone. So you'll be competing against three other knights in finding said Moonstone. And when you do, you'll need to enter Stonehenge at appropriate moon phase to your given owned Moonstone. And that should pretty much cleanse the world of all evil. Fingers crossed. Well, when they're out of your large and heavy armor globe, that is. In theory, Moonstone can be beaten in around an hour, in practice, it's highly unlikely. While looking for said stone, you'll fight your way through various monster and enemy lairs filled with bodies to the brim, you'll battle it out with other players, 1v1 style, in medieval bouts to the death, that is, you'll get better gear in the shops and even raise base stats via earned experience points. You can also gamble, fight the dragon, use various magic spells and kill the so-called guardian among others. But all that I'll let you discover in detail on your own. What Moonstone was most famous for though, other than its addictive gameplay that is, was its gore-filled presentation. The game's beyond brutal. After some battles the screen is more red than anything else and for the time there was just nothing like it on the market. But don't let it fool you. It's not a cheap money grab riding the crimson wave of pain. Moonstone is really a stellar title and an amazing time to be had with a group of friends. The Lost Files of Sherlock Holmes is a point-and-click adventure game inspired by the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. You, playing as Sherlock, third of the world's greatest detectives, well, first being Batman and second your mama, are asked by Inspector Lestrade to help him with a murder investigation of a young actress, Sarah Carraway. She was jumped behind the theater in Mayfair area of London and killed. Lestrade thinks that all the signs point to Jack the Ripper. You, however, are of the opposite assumption, noting that the victim fell caused by an unusual scalpel, one with a serrated blade. The case will take you and your loyal sidekick and heterosexual life partner Dr. Watson on a roller coaster of an investigation all around the city. You'll visit shops, zoological gardens, morgue pubs, Scotland Yard, Surrey Docks, Savoy Street Pier, St. Pancras Railway Station and many, many more other locations. And you will have your hands full getting to the heart of the thing. And no stone will be left unturned and no pint not drunk to the last drop. You'll also meet and interrogate many people and even employ few to assist you here and there. The game's played using a verb menu system and will require you to interact with many objects and people and solve numerous puzzles. Watson will take notes of any and all conversations in his journal and you can access them when necessary. Or when your memory fails, it's as feasible after all with so many clues that you'll no doubt find. Same as in the books, keen eye, observational skills, sharp mind and asking the right questions are all required to play and complete the lost files. But if you manage to, you'll find yourself having a lot of fun along the way and will be satisfied with how the plot progressed to its eventual conclusion. While The Lost Files of Sherlock Holmes is no doubt a fan favorite, and I did like it, it never really resonated with me as much as LucasArts' adventures did. Perhaps it's because it was too serious and I was too young to appreciate it, or perhaps it was a lack of quirky humor. Hard to tell. Today though, I can really appreciate its work. Bomberman aka Dynablaster is a perfect port of PC Engine's original. And when I say perfect here, I really mean it. Nothing was lost in translation. The game is amazing and infinitely playable. Easily one of the best competitive multiplayer games of its time. Especially that even up to 4 players could play on a single system all at once. I don't think there's anyone who haven't heard of Bomberman, but on an off chance that you slept under the rock, got stranded on a desert island or imprisoned in North Korea, I'll quickly try to explain. I will talk about multiplayer mode exclusively however, cause despite the game being playable alone too, and what you watching on a screen now cause I have no one here to play it with me, it was definitely not made with that in mind. In short, Bomberman is a game in which you're one of the few Bomberman. Who would have thought? And you are trapped in a maze. That maze is filled with destructible and indestructible bricks and you have to use bombs to open up passages and destroy opponent bombers. It sounds simple, but the addictiveness of this gameplay formula cannot be understated. It's a prime kind of fun. Under some of the bricks there are hidden buffs and upgrades and among these you'll find additional bombs, bigger explosions and faster movement to name a few. 
the round lasts until there's only one winner standing and the game is composed out of few rounds. In single player, you train to complete series of mazes to get to the infamous Black Bomber who kidnapped your beloved, battling through his goons along the way. Bomberman is frantic and extremely fun title when played against others. Not so much alone. Wizardry 7 Crusaders of the Dark Savant is a direct sequel to Aerial Bane of the Cosmic Forge that we've spoke about in the past and a first-person dungeon-crawling fantasy sci-fi role-playing game. Right after finding the Cosmic Forge, just as it's being taken away from them by the servant of the Cosmic Lord's Cyborg Aletides, our heroes realize that it's actually a clue to a location of the Astral Domina, the artifact of life hidden somewhere on the planet Guardia. So you, controlling that merry group, must travel there and find it. And while on Guardia, you'll obviously have tons of adventures. This time, however, you're not limited to dungeons only and can explore towns and vast forested areas between them too. Which perhaps was nothing new in the genre, but definitely first for the series. Generally speaking, the gameplay is not changed nearly at all from the previous outing and retained all classes, skills and the magic system. You view the world from the first person perspective and combat the enemies in turns. Which is amazing as I hate real-time combat in grid-based games. That's me though, and you may not be as opinionated about it as I am. Magic is spread into four schools of psionics, alchemy, theology, which being magic could be questioned based on its naming alone, and taumaturgy, which is the most terrible thing to pronounce to a not native English speaker such as myself. And there's six elemental categories of said magic. So, same as it was in earlier games. Anyway, that's what was kept from before. But there's quite a lot of new in Wizardry 7 too. NPCs have their own agendas and life schedules, so they may move around and can even hunt down objects in the game if you're not quick enough to find them first. Few extra skills not present in earlier titles have been added, most important of them the diplomacy, highlighting a much more important role of dialogues in this outing. Wizardry is also first of the bunch to offer auto-mapping and skill increase with usage, which is something you'd expect from games today, but back then it was rather fresh. Crusaders of the Dark Savant may not be the best RPG out there, but it's a very good one, one of the best for 1992 and a satisfying culmination for this long-running series of games. Star Control 2 is one of the most beloved and most important mixed genre games of the early 1990s. The Earth is enslaved by the evil race of Vulcan. What a terrible situation. And one that there's no escape from. Unless someone saves us all. Preferably someone courageous, strong and incredibly smart. Handsome too, cause why the hell not? Someone like you. So, you need to head off to space to find allies among the stars to try to overthrow the Urkan overlords. And since the Urkan are known to hunt down and imprison entire races in their own homeworlds, the potential and universal ethnic cleanse is a possible sad outcome. The game is part strategy, part role playing, part adventure and part arcade shooter. It's everything and anything rolled into one very enjoyable and engaging package. The space is two-dimensional in Star Control 2 and viewed from above. You can travel between various constellations and planets and meet different aliens, each of them having a certain sphere of control and influence around their home systems. You can deal with them either diplomatically via dialogue or engage in a more direct combat. First approach is obviously advisable in majority of cases and given the situation in the galaxy, especially because completing quests for the other species may result in them joining your side. On your quest for securing the Earth's and Universe's future, you'll need to upgrade your main ship, buy other smaller ones to accompany it and support it, and hire additional crew members, who funny enough work as HP points for the ship. You'll also fight quite a lot, and those encounters will be a good practice for more demanding battles that are to come later. And finally, you'll scan the planets and harvest them for their raw materials, Shakira style. So, wherever and whenever, you get a chance. These materials act as money when buying things at star bases, so you'll want to have as much as you can grab. Star Control 2 is a difficult game to describe in just a few sentences, but let the fact that it was remade years later and is still fixed and patched to this very day, and even released for free as the Urkan Masters, speak to its timeless quality. Alone in the Dark is a survivor horror with action-adventure elements and a spiritual precursor to Resident Evil games, as it was the very first ever 3D survival horror. The game is set in the Derseto, a Louisiana mansion belonging to recently gone Jeremy Hartwood. And sadly, Mr. Hartwood committed suicide there. You play as male or female protagonist, so either private investigator Edward Carnby or Emily Hartwood, Jeremy's niece. And you have to travel to the mansion to investigate the suspicious death. The mansion, however, is not as peaceful as it looks from the outside and is haunted by a whole manner of various monstrosities, from warp rats, zombies and ghosts all the way to the giant worms. And all of these are after your skin from the very moment that you entered. So, your mission is suddenly twofold. 
not only to figure out what happened, but most of all, to escape the mansion alive. There are numerous puzzles all throughout the game and they usually, but not always, end up requiring you to use appropriate objects in correct places. It's simple, but accompany the survival aspect nicely, adding to the tension and fear factor. While you can collect weapons and other items, you have to carefully manage your weight-based inventory, as you can only carry as much. Influences of Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft are quite obvious all throughout the story and will keep you on your toes all the way to the playthrough worthy end. Let me start by saying that while Dune 2 is more popular of the two games, I consider first Dune to be more memorable title. It's a masterpiece that effortlessly blends the adventure, strategy and economic genres for a very enjoyable experience. The game loosely follows Frank Herbert's novel with you placed in shoes of Paul Artridis. The Emperor Shaddam Corino IV has given the House Artridis the rights to manage extraction of spice melange on the desolate and desert planet Arrakis, the only place in the universe capable of producing it. And you know why? Cause it's poop. No, really, it is. Well, not human poop, mind you, but one produced by the giant sandworms living on the planet. And that magical, well, I say magical, but think chemical. Anyway, that, however you wanna call it precious poop, is indispensable in fueling the ships capable of interstellar travel. After all, as the saying goes, who controls the spice, controls the universe. So while realizing that the offer may be the trap orchestrated by the opposing house Harkonnen, Atreides agree on accepting the role despite that. In the adventure sections, you'll be mainly talking to various characters found in a book, and those conversations will push the plot forward while providing story background to all the strategy elements that you'll be in charge of too. So, you'll mind spice, wage war with the Harkonnen, and sooner rather than later. And even work on ecological issues with the Fremen too in their favor. All to exploit the planet for the priceless spice and to get rid of the evil opposing house. Once said spice starts flowing to the Emperor, however, since it's also a currency used for all the purchases, he will begin making demands for regular shipments. And you'll have limited time to fulfill them all, or otherwise he will invade the planet Dune and the game will end abruptly. Dune is neither the best strategy out there, nor great adventure really, being extremely linear, to the point of you taking part in most interactions, more as a passive witness rather than a person who can actually influence the choices taken. But all those parts put together make for a very atmospheric and fun game. Colin Curley, a mascot for the Quaver chips that I'm totally unfamiliar with, got so taken by the chips' delicious flavor that he lost his balance and dropped them down the giant anthill. You know, so far everything makes sense, right? So, to remedy the situation, he asks his ant friend to jump in and recover them. One by one. Cause you know, ants are small, strong, but small. Since the ant is rather stand-up fellow, or gal, the gender is rather undisclosed here, he slash she slash it agrees to help and our game begins. Pushover has it all. Graphics, music, sound, and most of all, addictive gameplay. The aforementioned Quaver's chips product placement is not only very superficial, but also largely irrelevant, as it doesn't affect the gameplay in any way. The idea here is simple. All yellow dominoes have to be knocked over in each level, always ending with a very specific one. And since there are many different kinds of these, each with its own unique behavior, so some destroy floors, some create bridges, some tumble, among others, all that guarantees levels being pretty challenging, but also incredibly fun and satisfying to figure out and solve. Each level completed is a single Quaver Chips chip recovered, so completing a whole bag for calling will take a long while. Pushover is very cleverly designed, as while it's difficult to ramp up and provides a constant challenge, it's never too much. And there are no levels that you won't be able to work out if you only give them a try or two. So, that constant supply of brain teasing, followed by an immediate gratifying solution, is what will keep you playing it all the way to the end. The fact that it looks damn cute and is super smoothly animated is just an added bonus. You're BJ Blazkowicz, an unfortunately named allied spy and the toughest SOB that the world had seen. Well, at least till the Doom guy and the Master Chief later on. But those icons aside, when the game is set, you are the toughest. I mean, you're you, so you would have been a force of nature even if the game didn't call for it, but fortunately it does and you can spread your ass kicking wings wide and utilize your iconic boot to the tooth and AZI conversion technique to the fullest. Is it working? Hard to tell, but the bodies you leave lying around everywhere you've passed through seem to suggest that you may need to work on it still. They seem more obliterated than converted. Anyway, Wolfenstein 3D is an episodic first-person shooter and a game that single-handedly kickstarted the entire FPS genre to the heights of popularity previously unseen. It was not the first, sure, not the best even, no doubt about that, but it was a first that was a complete and well-thought-out enough product to gain such a huge following. 
The first out of three Wolfenstein's episodes was released completely free as a shareware and published by Apogee. That distribution method can be accredited as being a cornerstone of its success. As many more players got to sample the frantic and fast shooting bonanza it offered for free and just couldn't shake the urge to keep going. And the solution to this painfully burning issue was that simple, to remedy it with a wallet. Each episode is built out of 9 levels, last one always ending with an epic boss fight. There's also a secret level hidden within the first 8, so it's worth to hack the walls too. Wolfenstein 3D received additional 3 episodes in Nocturnal Mission Pack that served as a prequel to the main game story and added more of the same blood pressure raising action packed goodness. Wolfenstein offers 5 unstoppable weapons. A knife, pistol, machine gun, gatling gun, and strongest one of them all, also one of the most notable in gaming overall, your epic jawline, which is not usable per se, but serves as means of intimidation for the enemies to fear. The arsenal may seem limited in choices, but it was more than enough for the first real game in the genre. There are a few additional pickups too, medikits, chicken meals, dog food, ammo and treasures for points. If you never played Wolf 3D, and I doubt that, let's make that clear, but if you really didn't, pause the video and go do just that. It's worth to learn why shooters look and play the way they do today. Formula 1 Grand Prix, aka World Circuit, is one of the best, if not the best, F1 simulation racer of the early 90s, and the first game in Geoff Cramont's famous Grand Prix series. It features all 16 official international GP circuits and 18 teams with 35 drivers based on real-life 1991 season. And while the names of the drivers are not real, clearly because of the licensing issues, they can be easily edited by hand in-game. The three game modes available are Quick Race, Single Race and Full Championship, and they are exactly what their names state. Quick, Single and Full. Also, new names for coffee sizes in Starbucks, so memorize them, it may come in handy later. What Formula 1 Grand Prix was best known for though, was its huge customization possibilities. They allowed you to adjust and tune many of the car's features, changing its on-track behavior and performance alike. So stuff like wing downforce, tires, gear ratios or even brake balance to name a few, I'm an idiot, ok? For me, it all sounds like magic spells torn out of generic RPG, but apparently people versed in cars and racing said that these were really, really well implemented and changes made to them could actually be felt while racing. There are also 6 rookie friendly options in the game that transform the gameplay from hardcore simulation to something akin to arcade racing. Auto gears, auto brakes, self writing spins and others. Also spells, just in another game. And while these options were not necessary addition to racing simulation, they were a very nice gesture towards less proficient gamers and those who don't care much for realism. World Circuit is played in full 3D, features working rear view mirrors, collision with other cars, crude damage model, debris flying everywhere and different weather conditions that influence how cars behave on the track. All that put together makes for an incredibly enjoyable gameplay, especially if you're a fan of F1. And I have a confession to make here. I don't care for F1 as a sport. And to be frank, I don't care about sports in general. They're just not my thing. But despite that, I actually always found World Circuit fun, even if I wasn't very good at it. History Line 1914-1918 is a spin-off from Battle Isle series taking part during World War I. And for all intents and purposes, it's the same exact game, just not sci-fi. So it's a turn-based strategy for up to two players laid on a hexagonal grid map. It depicts German forces invading France. And you can pick either of the sides to play as. Each of them having their own separate 24 mission strong campaign. There are also 24 additional two player maps not used in single player anywhere. Interestingly enough, History Line is kinda true to its name, as after each mission it displays a lot of historical facts for the period, with pictures covering the two appropriate past months of the campaign, and a pretty thorough technical specifications of units available in the game. Each turn you can move your units and plan attacks. When you're done, said attacks are simulated, and animations of them play out depicting how successful they were. The turn then switches to the computer, which does the same. Then, it's endless rinse and repeat until your eventual ultimate victory, cause you're you and failure is not an option. As the battle progresses, units gain experience based on the amount of damage they've caused to the opposing force and that experience has monumental influence on their strength and accuracy. Naturally, you've access to all, land, air and sea units of various kinds, with more of them being introduced gradually as the campaign progresses. Depots and factories are present on some maps too, usually in strategically important locations. First can be used to repair damaged or wounded units, while the second can manufacture new ones to serve as reinforcements for your forces. 
As the in-game time progresses between the missions, so will the seasons, and them changing actually influence terrain and efficiency of both sides of the conflict. Although History Line was rather well known, and a really, really fun game if you were into historical strategies that is, it never reached heights of Battle Isles popularity, and by extension of that, high enough sales numbers. So, the originally planned follow-ups in the series were preemptively canned. Dune 2, the battle for Arrakis, also known as the building of a dynasty, same as the first Dune we spoke about more or less 5-10 minutes ago, is based on Frank Herbert's book Dune and takes place on the planet Arrakis, the only place in the universe known to have spice melange deposits, a resource crucial for interstellar travel, and by extension of that, the most precious and expensive one in the whole galactic empire. The Emperor has invited three powerful houses, Harkonnen, Atreides and Ordos, to compete against each other in spice extraction and bring up its production considerably. Very quickly, however, the house's rivalry turns to violence and military competition, and if not for the Emperor, it would have definitely escalated to an all-out war. If that wasn't enough, the planet itself is hostile too, as it's a habitat for gigantic and near indestructible sandworms. And while they can be in most cases avoided, when they attack, they're deadly, as they literally swallow a unit's whole. Scary stuff. Even though the game is based thematically on the book and borrows from the source material in heaps, its story and gameplay have very little to do with either the book or the movie. Or movies, I should say, really, as with plenty of these by now. While technically Dune 2 may have not been the very first RTS, it's still universally considered to be the first modern RTS and a progenitor of the genre and a title that defined most of the staple RTS characteristics that we know and see in games even today. Things like gathering and processing of resources, use of said resources to build structures and train new needs, point and click command input for armies and the need to protect the gatherers as they're crucial for progress while being fragile and powerless in a direct combat at the same time. And finally, the circle of power, meaning that each unit had weakness that other unit could exploit and vice versa. So, knowledge of your army's composition was a key to success. It's a great and enjoyable title that did not age well sadly. Some design choices are clearly outdated by now, for instance, the fact that you can't control more than one unit at the time. Nevertheless, despite my complete indifference towards it, cause yeah, I'm not really a fan, Dune 2 is one of the most important games in history. And as such, and by extension of that, it's also one of the most important and best for 1992. Might and Magic 4 Clouds of Zin is a fourth in a series of 10 games spanning three decades and covering numerous settings and plots and most of all it's responsible for inception of brilliant later heroes of Might and Magic games. Distant Lands of Zin are about to fall under the control of a villain known as Lord Zin who had imprisoned a local overseer Crodo in a tower and is unleashing havoc across the lands. You and your band of local adventurers gets involved in this mystery and have to solve it and, well, as usual, save the proverbial day. Along with the world, but that's like your default task in all these games. And you never fail. Interestingly enough, if you combine Clouds of Zin with its successor Dark Side of Zin, they form so-called World of Zin together, a single or larger game with additional content, areas and quests. While each of the games have their own ending, when put together they offer a third and a unique one. But coming back to Clouds, it alone too introduced some of the new features, when comparing it to the third game at least. Notably, ability to pick an increased difficulty level, a separate inventory for quest items so that they wouldn't get mistakenly discarded and a new notes option, which allowed you to keep track of crucial gameplay information like quests, passwords, clues and important locations. While Might and Magic 4 is not my favorite part in the series, the improvements to the gameplay formula cannot be overstated and its importance in history of gaming either especially when combined with Dark Side of Zine. F15 Strike Eagle 3 is a third and last game in the trilogy of microprocess F15 based flight combat simulations, and a game that came out with a big boom, as in with explosion of quality, starting from the graphics, which is much, much, much better than ever before, especially when it comes to terrain and scenery with many well-known landmarks clearly visible, recognizable and at correct size when encountered like the Iraqi presidential palace in Baghdad, for instance. The planes look better too, your own, in particular, got a lot of detail work done to it. Sound design is pretty good too, definitely one of the best in the genre for the time, with all the beeps, creaks, swooshes and booms sounding the way they should, at least to my untrained ears. The flight model is as realistic as you'd expect from the last entry in the series and culminates the years of simulation with the most accurate approach to it Microprose have ever done. 
The titular craft is armed with both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground weapons and is capable of taking multiple types of missions in one of three theaters of operation, Iraq, Panama and Korea. All these campaigns are split into several smaller missions, each consisting of both primary and secondary goals. Some of these can even be played in co-op multiplayer, so that's fun too. Strike Eagle 3 was praised for its gameplay by both gamers and press upon its release and is considered one of the best games in its genre of the era. The Patrician is an unquestionable proof that in the 16-bit era, German developers were the absolute grandmasters of trading and management games. It's an incredibly deep and well-executed trading game that simulates very complex and dynamic economy, where nearly everything from fully working supply and demand to business investments and actions of all players influence it in one way or another. All that makes for a very realistic and life-filling market where everything seems to make sense and is not randomized or based on invisible variables. While your ultimate goal in Patrician is to become the leader of the so-called Hanseatic League, I prefer playing it as an open-ended title, where you grow your empire and amass wealth. You know, going for that dream of mine of becoming a traveling multimillionaire. And to do so, you have a multitude of available endeavors. You'll obviously be trading using both trading offices and ships, buying goods cheap and selling them at high profit where they're most needed, hopefully, because it's not unusual to cash in with a loss all to avoid even higher costs and to give you a chance to recuperate the losses faster. You'll also build public works, private houses, industries and can even pursue a political career. Interaction with pirates and burglars is also not something out of your sphere of interest if that's what you're after or means to an end of your intricate business or political strategy. I wouldn't say that the patrician was ahead of its time, but it was definitely a representative of the absolute best of the best the times could offer in a genre and a title that deservedly so gained huge popularity and recognition. What's best about it though is that unlike its genre brethren, it wasn't made targeting hardcore management and business simulation game enthusiasts, it has a very pleasant and colorful graphics, easy to use and grasp interface, so even newcomers to the virtual business world can jump in and quickly familiarize themselves with it without getting lost and slash or confused. If business games and thousands row strong Excel sheets are something you work on to relax, you'll love the patrician. Ultima 7 Part 1 The Black Gate is a vast and captivating role-playing game and a follow-up to the long-running series by Biden legendary Richard Garriott. It's also first or one of the first in many things that we take for granted in modern RPGs today, design-wise that is. It's the first Ultima using a top-down worldview that fills up the entire screen. It's also first to introduce deep and by then unseen true-to-life NPC scheduling, meaning their lives are fully planned out, simulated and they're going about their daily business as if you weren't there. So they go to work, after which they may visit a tavern for a drink or two and then they eventually go back home to sleep before another busy day. It may not seem like much now, but in 1992, when NPCs in most games just stood around in one spot, for days on end like stone pillars, never sleeping, resting or leaving their post, it was a huge improvement adding to the realism and atmosphere. This seemingly small change made you feel as if you were really part of a larger living world that kept going whether you were there to witness it or not. Additionally, it was the first title in the series to introduce full mouse driven drag and drop on all the objects in game and real time combat. Unlike previous Ultimas, you don't control a full party but only our main hero avatar and all of your companions that you will no doubt meet many of, naturally because of your magnetic personality, act on their own without any input on your end. And finally, Ultima 7 is the first title that was not only split in two identically numbered parts but each of them had a separate unique and its own add-on expansion. Interesting fact to keep a note of, if Avatar and his companions don't eat regularly in Ultima 7, they will die. You know, like in real life. So it's sorta a protoplast of the hardcore survival mode seen in many modern games too. Anyway, the Black Gate starts up in our quote-unquote real world where you sit at your computer and suddenly, out of nowhere, receive a mysterious message on your PC screen from a being claiming to be a guardian and telling you that Britannia entered the new age of enlightenment and soon everyone will bow to its new ruler you not being an exception from that. A moment later, a moon gate materializes and you being the nosy little geek that you are, enter through to once again as Avatar save the kingdom from the impending doom. How cool is that? Darklands is probably one of, if not the most ambitious RPG that's criminally overlooked and underrated by most DOS gamers. Also, probably the most broken. 
it was one of the most bug-ridden and terribly programmed games to ever come out. And trust me, it's not easy to challenge Bethesda in their element. They are, after all, masters of bugs and glitches. The first release of Darklands had a coding issue in it that could even potentially corrupt system files on users' hard drive. Which today may be funny, but back then meant picking between playing this amazing game and risking your system stability or having a safe day-to-day -day PC working environment, but no dragons to slay. It was all obviously fixed with a later re-release, but bad taste prevailed it seems, and Darklands never received recognition it truly deserved. It takes place in the Holy Roman Empire's territory of medieval Germany and is represented in unprecedented detail, with over 90 cities, calendar system, currency and even weapon and armor types being historically correct. The character creator is one of the most interesting ones I've seen to date too. After choosing your name, gender and social status you get to pick your initial occupation, which adds corresponding skill points but also 5 years to your age. And then you can keep adding more careers if you'd like to, each adding more and more skill points and years to your character. So it's a balancing act of finding a suitable middle ground between the strength and experience. Additionally, magic is substituted with alchemy and you can brew pretty much any and all potions you'd like given you're actually proficient enough to do so. Enemies and monsters that you'll face are all based on accurate at the time mythos in the region, so dragons, demons and witches may be something that you'll be facing at some point in one form or another. Darklands is entirely non-linear and completely open-ended, which is noticeable from the get-go, as your party of four starts in an inn in a randomly chosen city and not a predefined location. So each and every new playthrough may play out differently. And while your main goal theoretically is to defeat demon lord Baphomet, prevent the world-ending apocalypse and amass a lot of fame, funny enough quantified as a number, even after you do all that and watch the ending sequence, you can jump straight back in and carry on adventuring, completing quests and collecting experience. In its current form, patched and fixed, Darklands is an amazing experience that all fans of role-playing games should at least give a chance, as it will no doubt surprise them with its death and fun factor. I'm a huge Star Trek fan. In love, not in dimensions. And I consider its vision of a peaceful future in which we're no longer members of individual countries but just Earthlings, citizens of utopian vision of our planet and founding members of the United Federation of Planets to be very enchanting. And something we, in real life, as intelligent and civilized species should strive for. Is this ideal version of us even possible? Hard to tell. In Star Trek's universe it wasn't either initially, at least not until the first contact with other species, which opened our eyes to the fact that we're not center of the universe and that there are other, often much more advanced and developed beings. The technological and social leap that followed, while not instantaneous, catapulted us towards near utopian future. Star Trek is a subject I could talk about for hours, so I'm gonna stop now before this video becomes something it wasn't supposed to be at all. Star Trek 25th Anniversary is a point-and-click adventure game in which you play a role of Captain James Tiberius Kirk and along with your crew from the original series, you're on an episodic set of missions of diplomacy, discovery, adventure and exploration. Well, it would be more lore accurate if Kirk would also explore sexuality of various alien species, but that might have been too much for the early 90s game to handle. Each episode offers different problems to be solved and throughout the game you'll use skills and abilities of all crew members in a different way and capacity, where they fit best, preferably along Federation's integral goal of avoiding combat and violence as much as possible. So you'll be flying the USS Enterprise throughout the galaxy and controlling different crew members individually during numerous away missions. On which, as expected, you'll be meeting alien species, engaging in diplomacy and solving many problems and puzzles, most of which are nearly never inventory-based and often rely on you having at least fundamental knowledge of the individual team members' skill sets to solve them. Away teams always consist of Kirk, Spock, McCoy and one of eight different red shirts many of whom face possibility of dying during missions. Each of the seven included episodes play out exactly like they would in the TV show and it makes for a very authentic and atmospheric feeling experience. Star Trek 25th Anniversary is a pretty darn good adventure game and it's worth checking out even if you're not into the source material. The Legend of Kyrandia series of adventure games are among the most acclaimed point-and-click titles ever released. This first title is no different. You're Brandon, a grandson of a wise wizard Kalak who has been turned into a stone statue by a formerly imprisoned psychotic jester Malcolm. Malcolm's evil scheme sets him on the trajectory to take over the Kyrandia and he wants to lay down his revenge on the mystics that kept him locked off for 18 years. To prove that you'll the hero that we always take you for, you'll need to stop the nefarious Malcolm and ultimately become the king of the realm yourself. 
And why would a simple nobody become one? Well, as it turns out, you were a prince and the rightful heir to the throne, raised in hiding after the king and queen were killed by Malcolm years prior. As in most adventure games, you'll encounter many puzzles along the way, some requiring use of items picked up on your travels, others use of magic. And even though some of these will be slightly randomized, relying on little trial and error at times, they won't be overly difficult and shouldn't discourage from completing the game. That said, it's worth to be wary of what, when and how you're trying to do, as there are moments when incorrect or rash action may end up being an instant game over. So either be very, very careful or save often. Overall though, Legend of Carendia is chock full of quirky humor, interesting characters and tells a captivating but easy to follow story that you will no doubt seek to complete and see the resolution of if you only start playing. Especially because the point and click interface has been simplified to the absolute minimum, getting rid of all the excessive buttons or verbs. You have a mouse and its cursor, and armed with that and your mastery in clicking, you interact with the whole game world. Some may find it oversimplified as compared to the other titles in the genre, I think it's a natural evolution. I don't need a set of verbs after all, to know not to talk to stone boulders, to not to try to pick up wooden hats or to fight with my shadow and the screen space saved by this seemingly insignificant change was better utilized to hold your inventory and offers a bit larger display area. It's a solution that allows you to immerse yourself in this enchanting world as much as it's possible without worrying about controls. Frederick Pool's Gateway is a video game adventure and it takes place in the future when travels around our solar system is much easier accessible and not a stuff of sci-fi only. We found a series of gigantic artificial underground tunnels under the surface of Venus, seemingly created thousands of years ago by an advanced now gone race of interstellar beings known as Hichi. And as we dug deeper and deeper uncovering the secrets of the tunnels we eventually found incredibly old but still functional Hichi ship. It may be ancient, but to us the technology was uber advanced and unlike anything we've seen. That discovery then leads to finding an abandoned Hitchy space station with a lot of these empty ships docked at it. The station becomes known as Gateway and humanity's only connection point to the rest of the universe. Since traveling to these far off places often poses a serious, deadly even risk to the traveler, only the most courageous adventurers, known as prospectors, who volunteer to do so are allowed to travel to the depths of the universe and the gateway. And you play as one of them. On one of your travels you discover an ancient alien device warning of an extremely dangerous and deadly species known only as the Assassins, and you're entrusted with the task of learning all about them and protecting humanity from the threat. This is how the game begins. For all intents and purposes, Gateway is very similar to Legend's other adventure titles, featuring identical text parser and point-and-click hybrid interface, allowing for navigation through the game world with either, and a first-person view. Graphics are mostly static and showing what your character is in the presence of with an occasional small animation here and there in the background to add flair. As you're on your adventure, you'll visit and explore many planets, meet intelligent species of various kinds and encounter many, many puzzles, most of which are inventory-based, heavily relying on logic and often ingeniously integrated into the plot. There are no false barriers or stopping points preventing story progression here at all or any kind of trial and error. Correction, whenever I'm playing the adventure game, there's always trial and error. If you can endure the rather static presentation, Gateway is not only one of the best adventure games of the year, but of all gaming overall. The story is incredibly deep and involving, the lore is rich, detailed and beautifully translated from the original books to the computer screens and the adventure you'll be on will be fun like no other. I declare 1992 the year of DOS adventure. And while there have been plenty of incredible experiences in other genres released for it too, adventure games were definitely in their prime. I mean, you're here, you've seen this video, so you have an opinion about it too. What do you think then? Am I right or am I not wrong? Yep, I know what I did there and I'm not ashamed. Anyway, did you play it, remember or even heard of any of the 25 best games for the year? Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.